Good evening, everybody, and welcome. We are so excited that you could join us today for On the Zen of Therapy. My name is Alex Elliott, and I am the Senior Manager of Events and Engagement for the Public Programs Department of California Institute of Integral Studies, a nonprofit university in San Francisco. As many of us are descendants of settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, we, CIIS Public Programs, must recognize and never forget that our university's building in San Francisco occupies traditional, unceded Ramaytushaloni lands. If you are interested in learning more about Native lands, languages, and territories, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. Now let me first introduce our presenters this evening, Alzac and Mark, and then we'll get right to their conversation. Alzac Amlani has been core faculty in the Integral Counseling Program here at CIIS since 2007. He has been a practicing psychologist in the San Francisco Bay Area since 1997, and has been greatly influenced by Buddhism, Jungian psychology, and the diamond approach. His writings are in the areas of intuition and archetypes, Eastern and Western views on human development, integration of psychotherapy and spirituality, and integral education. He has presented on these topics at various universities and conferences in the US, India, China, and Russia. Mark Epstein is a psychiatrist in private practice in New York City and the author of a number of books about the interface of Buddhism and psychotherapy, including Advice Not Given, The Trauma of Everyday Life, Thoughts Without a Thinker, and Going to Pieces Without Falling Apart. He received his undergraduate and medical degrees from Harvard University. And now it is my absolute pleasure to turn it over to Alzac and Mark. Hello, Mark. It's great to see you. Hello, Alzac. And, it, and it's really a delight to have you here at CIS, especially after your accomplishment of your most recent book. I've read and actually included some of your other books, Going on Being and Thoughts Without a Thinker in some of my classes. So I'm excited that I've got another piece to work with now. In your uh, book, Zen of Therapy, you state that your intention is to show that meditation does not have to be a solitary intrapsychic endeavor. We can also work interpersonally and to demonstrate that emotional life rather than being a distraction, can serve as a critical doorway to spiritual understanding. And I was quite intrigued about that integration that you brought. There's such a complexity and richness in how you take us into the room with your patients and how you weave your psychotherapeutic work primarily from Western psychoanalytic approaches as well as your Buddhist uh, meditation and study over the last 30 years. You sprinkle various chapters with Japanese haiku, and you also quote from the musician John Cage in a few chapters. And I especially enjoyed reading about your psychological understanding of the life of the Buddha. Maybe you could start with this larger context and how these various streams have come together for you, especially in writing this book. I'd be happy to. Um, I'm not sure that everyone who's 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 listening knows my background or anything. So that I think it might be helpful just to start with a little bit of uh, of that material. The this kind of strange thing and the unique thing uh, about my experience is that. Although I am a traditionally trained psychiatrist, which means I went to medical school, uh, you know, et cetera, um, I was immersed in Buddhist thought and Buddhist practice uh, from a very young age, way before I decided to uh, become a psychiatrist. So I was, you know, fortunate enough to be exposed to uh, uh, Vipassana meditation, mindfulness meditation. Uh, teachers like Joseph Goldstein, Jack Kornfield, Sharon Salzberg, Ramdas, uh, starting in my early, early 20s. 
and traveled in Asia with all of them to meet their spiritual teachers and so on. And then went from that experience, doing a lot of uh, silent retreats, as many as I, as I could uh, manage to integrate into my life at the time. Uh, I went from all of that to medical school and then to training as a psychiatrist. So um, all of that training, um, which uh, I had under the, the umbrella of a lot of very good traditional psychoanalytic uh, 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 psychotherapists, I, I looked at that training always through a Buddhist lens because the, the Buddhist psychology was already, that was the first thing that I found that made any sense to me. Um, so uh, all of my writing and a lot of my clinical work in the next you know, 40 years or whatever it has turned out to be um, uh, has been about first, uh, in my mind, trying to translate or interpret uh, Buddhist psychology uh, into the Western psychodynamic language uh, that we all speak, even if we're not Freudian, you know, uh, that the, those, those ideas of a uh, hundred years of psychoanalysis have kind of permeated the way we think about our minds and our personalities, our character, and so on. So I wanted to make Buddhist psychology, Buddhist meditation, I wanted to explain it in a way that uh, Western people could understand. That was my, my, my internal mission in a lot of my uh, early books. Um, but the question that kept coming to me that I uh, evaded as, as much as I could uh, for many years was, well, okay, okay, but how do you actually bring your, your Buddhist understanding, your meditation background, how do you bring that into the practice of psychotherapy? Do you teach your patients to meditate? Do you sit silently with them? Do you, do you give them instruction? Uh, and I was always, no, no, I'm just, uh, when I'm a therapist, I'm just being a therapist. But, and hopefully if the, Buddhist, uh, if the Buddhist thing has made an impression on me, uh, it should be coming through me in some way. Um, so I, I was content to let it be a kind of implicit or silent influence. Um, if patients would come to me who were interested in Buddhism or wanted to learn about meditation, I would certainly give them guidance, tell them where to go to learn. But, uh, but I didn't actively try to proselytize or convert or even teach meditation in the psychotherapy office. I was content to just be the therapist. Um, but with this book, which I began probably three or four years ago, uh, when I was already in my early to mid 60s, uh, I decided, okay, it's been enough time I should be able to start to answer that question. How am I really bringing my Buddhist self, if we can use that word, uh, how am I really bringing my Buddhist self to this practice of psychotherapy? And um, uh, I decided to set myself a, uh, an agenda to try to find out or to try to describe, to try to put words on something that, that uh, I had avoided putting words on because I wanted it to come, as I said, more organically. Um, so uh, I decided towards the end of 2018 to write down at least one psychotherapy session uh, a week in which I felt that something of my spiritual uh, understanding or background or attempt to uh, you know, channel that, that something of my spiritual understanding was infiltrating the psychotherapy session. Uh, and I, I decided I would try to do that at least one session a week. So I would take notes uh, immediately after the session, which I don't ordinarily do unless I'm giving medication or something you know, extremely important has happened. Uh, but I tried as much as possible to write the session down. Uh, and then in my writing time, usually over the weekend or the following Monday, I tried to write the session up, um, you, you, describing it uh, as close to the bone as I could, but in a, you know, in a kind of literary fashion. Um, and I did that for a year, forcing myself to, uh, to pick these sessions out. And... Um, not following any given patient, but, uh, but allowing, because I'm, I'm seeing 30 or 40 people a week, allowing one session to, you know, this is the one that speaks to me. So at the end of a year, 
I had a kind of mosaic or a collage or a kaleidoscopic version of, you know, one year's worth of therapy in my office. And, um, uh, and then I started to read through the sessions, which I hadn't done for the entire year to see it, what I might discover from, uh, from, from what I had recorded, you know? Um, and that was the beginning of this book that then uh, I can go on talking. Um, I hope you, um, you, hopefully you have other questions that, uh, that I'll give you time for. But um, uh, after, after um, going through the year's worth of sessions, I, I took that stack of material and showed it to the editor that I have at Penguin. Uh, who did my last two books to ask her mm -hmm. if she thought there was something of interest here and she read through it and and she said yeah i think there's something here people will be interested in this you know a therapist kind of showing what goes on uh like in treatment or something um but she said there's no real the only real through line is you because you're not following any individual cases so she suggested that i go through and write like a reflection or a commentary uh, on each sec on each session, showing more about what was going through my mind, uh, what what I was seeing, what I was thinking in in each session. So I I always listen to her because she only gives me very tiny bits of advice, which are usually correct. Um, and then COVID hit, so so it, it so happened that this year of recording these um, these psychotherapy sessions turned out to be the last year before COVID. So everything went remote. Um, I had a record of the last year of face-to-face -face in office psychotherapy, you know, and then I was um, in quarantine, you know, uh, with this project. So it was a very good time. It was like being on retreat, like a writing retreat. Mm. And I really spent time with going through the sessions and thinking about what, uh, what might have happened and what I was seeing. And meanwhile, the seasons were passing. It was like, you know, winter and then spring. And, and I'm really noticing all like I'm in the country and, you know, uh, um, uh, the clouds and the flowers and the summer and fall. So um, each session started to look like a uh, Japanese haiku, uh, you know, because uh, in, in the tiny details of the session, I started to see, oh, there's so much happening. So, uh, so that's where the Zen of therapy, which is the title of the book, that's where that started to come in. So, uh, so that theme of uh, looking at the tiny details and seeing you know, the whole world, uh, I started to tap that. Uh, and, then, and then I let myself bring in all the other important influences uh, uh, that have been with me for many years now. So including the composer, John Cage, the British uh, pediatrician and psychoanalyst, Donald Winnicott, uh, Ram Dass, the Dalai Lama, Joseph uh, uh, Goldstein and Jack Kornfield. Uh, there's a, a British writer, Adam Phillips, who's influenced me a lot. So all, the, the, the book became a kind of woven tapestry of uh, all of these influences on my way of thinking and working. And, um, uh, that's probably enough <laughs> as a first answer. We could talk about it more. That's, that's beautiful. Um, I love how <clears throat> it took several iterations and you didn't know exactly where it was going to lead and how it sounds like the writing of it and then collaborating with your editor and then the ambiance of the seasons, it all sort of fed into the creation yeah. of the book. And that really comes through in the way you've written it yeah it, i really didn't know <clears throat> excuse me that it would be a book at first and it was only mm -hmm. in writing those those reflections that i started to get a sense of oh this really could be a book and um it, <clears throat> it really was interesting for me like what 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 how am i bringing a, a buddhist sensibility to what i'm doing i started to pick out some of the uh, important themes in, in, uh, for me uh, in what that might mean. Uh, and then, uh, of course, I had to show everything that I was writing to the patients who I was writing about. Uh, so my 
description of the sessions and then my commentary on the sessions. And we would have a back and forth about uh, what pseudonym did they want to use? And uh, was it, could I change, how could I change the identifying characteristics? But, but we wanted to make the sessions as accurate as possible. And, um, and they learned more from that process because I had to tell them more about what I was actually thinking than I would do ordinarily in a regular session. And so those sessions that would have probably disappeared into the recesses of the past became in a kind of anti-Buddhist way because they were preserved, you know, uh, but they became, <laughs> they, they became touchstones in a way for the, these various psychotherapies that we were engaged in together. Wow, fascinating. So multiple levels of work going on here, so many um, which is so, yeah, so rare and so unusual. So I'm, I'm trusting it was quite an enriching process for you to engage all these levels with the folks, the patients that you worked with. One of the themes that really struck me is you said um, how um, I'm Curious, one of the things that you spoke about is how are interpersonal encounters meditative, you know? Um, and so you're speaking about the relationship, the work you're doing with patients for the session, during the session as meditative encounters. Um, can you speak um, more about, as interpersonal encounters, excuse yeah, me, can sure, you speak more sure. about how they're meditative? Oh, sure. Well, we're used to thinking of meditation as something that we do in a solitary way, you, you know, that it's a one person, it's a one person uh, event, yeah. uh, uh, intrapsychic, like we're looking inside ourselves and cultivating a certain kind of posture, mental posture or, or, or mental stance. Um, but why should meditation have to be so uh, uh, internal? Why, 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 that's where the John Cage influence started to come in for me. J John Cage, I don't know, I don't know how familiar you are with him, but uh, he studied Buddhism in 1951 with a visiting Japanese Buddhist scholar, uh, D.T. Suzuki, who taught for two years at Columbia and all the sort of downtown bohemian intelligentsia, uh, Eric Fromm, Karen Horney, Allen Ginsberg, mm -hmm. Thomas Merton, uh, uh, Agnes Martin, Philip Guston, uh, and John Cage, among others, went to these Buddhist lectures. And Cage was, Cage understood it, got it, but said, I've already decided to devote my life to music. So uh, any kind of sitting meditation is just going to get in the way of my music. So I'm going to bring what I've learned about meditation to my work as a composer and my work as a musician. And so the first move that he made was to stop discriminating between musical sounds and non-musical sounds. So not, and in, in um, mindfulness meditation, we say, don't push away the unpleasant, don't cling to the pleasant, or if there's something a little perverse about you, don't push away the pleasant and don't cling to the unpleasant, you know, but try to give impartial attention to everything there is to observe. Now, Freud, when he taught physicians practicing psychoanalysis, said exactly the same thing. He said, you know, suspend judgment and give impartial attention to everything there is to observe. If you read those words and didn't know it was Freud, you would think it was D.T. Suzuki or you would think it was John Cage. So there's a linking thing, you know, right there. Um, so, uh, and what is the point of meditation or of mindfulness? Is it to uh, be able to be in the present moment with your breath? Is that the ultimate point? Or is the point to be able to be present with your partner, with your children, with your, you know, in your work environment, in the garden, with the outside world. So already we know from the practice of meditation that it's not meant to be only internal. And in fact, what is, is there a distinction? Thich Nhat Hanh uh, would always say, you know, uh, uh, breathe in, breathe out, but uh, eventually you find there's no distinction between inner and outer. Mm. So why not bring that attentional posture, that attentional attitude that we learn from meditation, why not bring that to the practice of psychotherapy? Um, and in fact, 
you know, I, I'm a psychiatrist, as I mentioned, which means I went to medical school, which means that um, when it comes time to actually training as a psychiatrist, they don't really give you any teaching. You, you know, it's like when it's mm -hmm. when it's time to do dermatology, you go in and work with the dermatologist. When it's time to do surgery, you go in and assist the surgeon. When it's time to do psychiatry, you get a patient and you go in a room with them. And uh, so when that when that happened to me, what I yeah. had to draw on was my own experience watching my own mind and my own experience in psychotherapy myself as a patient. But I decided right away, yeah. what if I try to give the same kind of non-judgmental, impartial attention that I've practiced on myself? What if I try to apply that to this patient, this first patient of mine? And that seemed to work. You know, um, so I think that kind of attention is fundamental to establishing a therapeutic alliance with the, with the patient. And that's, you know, I talk about that a lot in the book, and I can talk about that as, as much as you want. But uh, but that's the that's the beginning of seeing psychotherapy as an interpersonal as a two person meditation. Uh, and I think there's some way, you know, in Buddhism, we we talk about transmission, like what is what does it mean to get transmission or give transmission? But I think there's some way that a, a therapist's attentional sensibility mm -hmm. is felt by the patient, you, you know, uh, and that if the therapist is too intrusive or too withholding, that mm -hmm. a, the patient's defenses are, are aroused in order to guard against the, the threat, either of, you know, interference or abandonment. But if a therapist can be present in this way that both Freud and Buddha uh, emphasized, then a, a patient becomes freer, it's safer. We're creating a safer environment for people to talk about what's really happening in their own experience, you know, rather than putting a facade on even for a therapist. Yeah, so I, that's that's beautiful i can see how that's that is clearly a meditative experience because that's when we're sitting we're also trying to create some sort of a holding experience or a, a presence that can allow our own consciousness our own thoughts feelings experiences to arise and be witnessed in that way just, and in psychotherapy just, give, just giving mm -hmm. your full attention to another person you know a, a therapist is uniquely yeah. positioned to yeah. give their full attention to the client, to the patient, to the person. And yes. that's such an unusual experience for, you know, for the other. Absolutely, yeah. So um, you also talk about looking further and feeling into our emotional lives. And by doing that, we gain spiritual understanding. And I so appreciated that because you're again linking our own psychological material, our reactivity, our emotions, you know, and that they need to be held, they need to be seen, they need to be witnessed in the way you're talking about um, by a therapist or by another. And that actually leads to spiritual understanding. Um, so can you speak more about that as well? And how, how does that do that? How does that work for you? Uh, well, I, I think there's a tendency in um, spiritual circles, uh, and but not only in spiritual circles. I think it's a tendency; it's a widespread tendency to um, try to either rise above, or bypass, or suppress mm -hmm. uh, difficult emotional experience. You know why? Because it's difficult. It's unpleasant. You, you know, uh, and uh, it would be easier if we didn't have to feel it. You, you know, so uh, even the Buddha in the, in the Buddhist time when he taught his fundamental psychology, you know, in the form of the Four Noble Truths, his first truth, he just used a single word and it was dukkha, you know, D dukkha is ordinarily translated as suffering, which is not the best translation. What the, the word connotes more like a, a sense of pervasive unsatisfactoriness in life, even when, thing, when there's pleasant things going on, you know in the back of your mind that it's not going to last, you know. But, um, uh, but the word, if you, if you take the word apart, the word dukkha, ka is face, 
and duk means like difficult. So the Buddha is saying there's there's something difficult to face in life. You know, the, the, there's an opposite word, sukha, which is sweet, sweet to face, so that the happiness, the joy. But dukkha, there's there's an element, there's a dimension to life that's hard to face. We want to turn away. You, you know, so that's been going on since the Buddha's time. You know, and so what's the Buddha saying? He's saying that just perpetuates suffering, the turning away. Mm-hmm. What we what we have to do, what we have to learn if we're going to follow the Four Noble Truths, what we have to learn how to do is to face that which is difficult. So from a psychotherapist point of view, what is it that's difficult? You know, uh, uh, usually, usually there's something difficult that's bringing someone into therapy, um, but they're not always so tapped into what it really is. They might be blaming uh, this person or that person or or themselves, uh, rather than uh, uh, actually uh, dealing with what is their emotional experience that they're having trouble with. So uh, I liked uh, to look back at what's written about the Buddha's life um, for inspiration. And what I, what I found is that, and I knew this, but no one had ever really done anything with this that I had seen. You know, the Buddha's mother died when when the Buddha was a week old. He was like born from her side. He must must have been a cesarean section or something. Anyway, she lived for a week and then she dies. And um, the Buddha, you know, when he gets to be 29 years old, he replicates his mother's abandonment of him by leaving his wife and newborn child and going off to the forest to seek his enlightenment. And for, for years, the, the path the Buddha takes is the one that you're asking about, where he tries to suppress, to step on, to, or to rise above, to eliminate all the toxic feelings, all the difficult feelings, you know, his rage, his sense of abandonment, I would say, his sense of personal emptiness, what it would whatever it might have been. He became a master of austerities, like a modern day patient who suffers from anorexia, you know, uh, stopped eating, became to- totally emaciated, drinking his own urine uh, until he was fa- one day he's falling over on himself because uh, he's lost all of his bodily strength. And then he has a childhood memory. Uh, the only time in the story of the Buddha's life where a childhood memory comes into play. And he remembers a joyful feeling of when he was a boy sitting under a rose apple tree, it mm-hmm. said, watching his father plowing in the fields. So uh, I take that as like a Winnicottian idea of like a, the, a child who knows his father or mother is in the distance, but is left alone enough to, mm-hmm. uh, to go off into his or her own imagination, you know? So he's sitting under the tree. Uh, he's he's blissing out, he has a joyful feeling, and he remembers that feeling. And he has enough presence of mind, it's like a, a, a first kind of self analysis, you know, uh, he has enough presence of mind to say to himself, why am I remembering this at this moment, this joyful feeling, you know, when I'm at the height of my ascetic practices. And he thinks, maybe I'm trying to tell myself something, you know, maybe the way I'm going about this trying to look away from everything that's difficult. Um, Maybe it's the wrong path. And maybe this joyful feeling is actually the key to the enlightenment that I'm seeking. And and then he says, but with a body so emaciated, there's no way I would have the strength to sustain any kind of joy in this body. And and at that moment, a a young woman named Sujata comes into his presence. And I start my book with this story because uh, she comes bearing a bowl of rice porridge, you know, like of, uh, of milk rice, um, uh, because she thought her, her, um, her nursemaid uh, uh, told her that there was a spirit uh, um, under this tree that she had gone to wanting to get pregnant, and she had left an offering uh, for this tree spirit and then had conceived. And then her, her assistant told her, I saw the spirit, you know, he's there. So she comes with milk rice for the spirit, but it's the Buddha. And he takes the nourishment and uh, she she's like embodies the mother that he had lost um, or the spiritual friend that he needed, you know, and uh, 
he proceeds from there to go to uh, his seat of enlightenment. You know, he walks for a couple of days and sits under the tree and then has all these experiences. But it's because he turned himself around. And that that memory is said to be the um, beginning of the Buddha's uh, middle path, which is, you know, not the indulgence of sense desire, but not the not the reaching into the ascetic practices. So uh, I think there's something there about permitting emotional experience, the entire range of emotional experience. I think the Buddha was trying to work out something that many of us in our psychotherapies are also trying to work out, which which is, you know, earlier uh, difficulties, losses, uh, uh, feelings of estrangement, uh, dissociation, and so on. And he found his way through that by turning himself around uh, at that moment and allowing the entire range of his emotional experience to enrich his mind. Wow, I don't think I've ever heard that synthesis put together of his own trauma and asceticism and spiritual bypass and then the movement towards his healing in the middle path. That's that's really, uh, that's profound and, and so instructive, I think. Uh, for so many of us on the spiritual path or the psychological path. And related to that, you have a couple of um, cases in your practice, at least, where you're talking about the inner critic, the superego, um, anger turned inward, um, this process of uh, where we move towards self-loathing and self-rejection and how painful that is and how you work with uh, your patients around those themes, and that accessing our anger, our aggression, and appropriately expressing and integrating is actually a pathway towards compassion, you know, which is a really significant linking that you're doing there. Um, and related to that, I'm, I'm curious about, um, you know, I think that for many listeners, you know, who might be, you know, Buddhist practitioners who want to focus on compassion and equanimity, you know, and anger and aggression is to be eschewed, or nice empathic therapists who don't want to also be angry or, you know, hold their aggression. So if you could talk a little bit more about um, this process, this relationship between anger and kindness and compassion. I think that would be really powerful. Sure. Well, the, the, um, the way I structured the book um, was both according to the seasons, as I was mentioning to you earlier, um, winter, spring, summer, fall. Uh, but then for each of the four parts, uh, each of the four seasons, I also wanted to have an element or an aspect of the traditional Buddhist path of insight. So uh, the first section uh, became clinging because that's, that's what uh, uh, usually brings us into practice or into therapy, some kind of clinging. The second section was mindfulness. The third section was insight. And the fourth section was going to be compassion you know, because that's sort of the, the, the ladder or the trajectory or the path. Uh, but all the, uh, all the psychotherapy sessions in the fourth section, with which was supposed to be compassion, when I read through them, they were all about anger or aggression, you, you know. Um, <laughs> and they, they were all about that because uh, um, in, order to, in order to reach not sentimental compassion or sort of false compassion, but in order to reach real compassion, I think, but this is not my original thought, I can tell you where, whose, whose ideas I'm drawing on with this, uh, but in order for compassion truly to develop in a child in a, or in an adult, uh, one has to reckon with one's own rage, with one's own anger, with one's own hatred. So often, over the years when I've been teaching, sometimes with Sharon Salzberg, sometimes with Robert Thurman, sometimes the three of us, teaching to mostly Buddhist audiences, there's a famous paper that uh, uh, Donald Winnicott, the child psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who I mentioned earlier, who is one of the grandfather figures that I'm uh, channeling in, in my book, um, 
uh, Winnicott wrote a famous paper called Hate in the Countertransference, in which he talks about, like the, he outlines like the 15 reasons why a mother hates her infant. Um, and, and, and he's got a great sense of humor, Winnicott. So, it, so, uh, so each, each reason is, you know, like uh, he fusses all day and then she takes him out in the stroller and a neighbor says, isn't he sweet? Or, uh, you know, mm. uh, he, he won't take the mother's <laughs> food, but then, but then takes the bottle from the nanny kind of thing. Um, so, so Winnicott, I mean, what, he's amazing on this theme. Uh, and all, all my books I draw on Winnicott, and in this one I tried to keep Winnicott out of it until I got to the fourth section, which was to be about compassion, and then I just needed so much of Winnicott. So <laughs> what, 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 what I like reading that paper to the Buddhist audience is because it makes them a little nervous, because as you're saying, there's a big tendency um, in spiritual circles to downplay uh, one's own inner violence, you know, uh, and to pretend that it's not there. So I like to bring it out therapist that I am so that people can reckon with it. Um, Winnicott's point is that there's no way in any kind of intimate relationship where people need so much from each other that uh, the entire range of emotions aren't um, brought out, that a therapist inevitably feels anger at demanding patients, that patients inevitably feel anger at withholding or appearing to be withholding therapists, that babies uh, uh, have not yet differentiated their anger from their need, their anger from their hunger, their rage from their desire. Babies are like one bundle of emotion and they attack the parent with what Winnicott, uh, his favorite word was ruthless. So with, with a kind of ruthless desire uh, babies go at their parents. And so uh, Winnicott's first point in this paper is that the good enough parent, and he, he coined that phrase, the good enough mother, the good enough parent, the good enough parent doesn't reject or abandon uh, or interfere, you know, doesn't get anxious, doesn't get withdrawn in the face of the baby's aggression that the good enough parent is able to, you know, kind of uh, jostle, tease, hold, you know, reassure, like, I know you're upset, but what is it you need? We just have to change you. you may, are you hungry? You know, it's okay. The, the, the good enough parent, the devoted parent in Winnicott's view is able to create a good enough holding environment that the baby doesn't get the feeling that their anger is so destructive so overpowering that they will destroy the very person who they need the most. So anger gradually gets, gets um, integrated into the whole range of human experience rather than becoming the great destructive emotion that we all fear that it is. So Winnicott says something similar is going on in the therapeutic couple, something similar is going on in our intimate relationships, um, and uh, that the um, in the childhood version, when the growing child starts to realize that the mother and father are going to sometimes disappoint him or her, uh, that actually they're not under the baby's omnipotent control, you know, that they're going to be let down or disappointed sometimes, but that the parents will come through, the baby starts to get the sense of the parent as having their own self, their own separate self, not being under the, their total control. And that that is the seed of compassion because the baby can start to understand that, oh, there's another person there, you know, another person separate from me, but like me, you, you know, uh, but different from me. Um, and that the therapy provides a um, uh, another, uh, another version, another attempt to make that leap uh, fr from um, uh, self-involved self sense of, uh, you know, why am I not being attended to the way I need to be attended to, to 
oh, I understand. You're like another person. You're separate. Person. That's the seed of kindness, the seed of empathy, the seed of compassion. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So you, in one of your chapters, you, um, there is uh, one of your patients who is seeking a particular kind of healing, understanding, I think, from his parents. And if I recall, you're recognizing that he may not get that uh, from his parents. And then you go further and you say something like, um, you're the healer. Um, and I, I wrote it down, if I can just spot it. Um, yeah, here it is. That you don't, you're saying you don't need healing, that you, you are the healer. Um, and then you evoke uh, the Buddhist bodhisattva of compassion, Kuan Yin, meaning she who hears our cries and you, you explain that. Um, so I was really struck by how you helped helped him take that leap potentially, you know, from somebody who was identified perhaps with his emptiness, with his needs, with his woundedness. Well, no, towards... it's, more, it, it's, it's more intense than that. Um, so th this okay. case you're referring to was the, it's the first mm -hmm. case that I, that I wrote down, even before I had set the agenda for the entire book. So the, the, the patient in question was the child of uh, two Holocaust survivors. Um, each, of, each parent had had a, a family in the old world, um, children, husbands, wives in the old world, uh, who had been eliminated, destroyed, killed, murdered in the um, concentration camps. And they, they had met in a displacement. The parents met after liberation. Um, uh, uh, they walked from the, from the camp uh, that they were released from in Germany. They walked to France. Um, and then they came to America. And then they had this, uh, this uh, man who became my patient. So he grew up uh, in the shadow, uh, you know, with the, um, the horror untalked about, rarely talked about uh, horror of both of his parents having lost their, their children. He was the, he and his sister born after the war were the, you know, uh, all that, all, all they had. But uh, he had the sense of this incredible grief in, uh, in both of his parents that he could never reach, you know, because they uh, had to keep it uh, uh, they were doing their best, I think, and he thinks, to uh, just just to uh, go on being, you know. So his cry, uh, uh, when he was a boy growing up, he would always ask his parents, was I a good boy today? You know, because he could sense their suffering. Uh, and as, as children often are, uh, he, he was taking responsibility for the parents' suffering. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't understand the Holocaust. He didn't know about the, you know, did, none of that could have made sense to him. So he just felt their pain and then was trying to be as, you know, uh, trying to be a good boy. By the time he came to therapy and he's like in his 50s or whatever, he, um, he's, his plea to me, which you were referencing, was, um, will I ever be healed? When will I ever be healed? Because he was carrying this pain, not just his pain, the generational pain, the pain of his parents now deceased. Will I ever be healed? So my, um, my um, improvisational response to him, not thought out in, in advance, but I had heard this cry from him in other sessions. My response on this day was, you don't need to be healed. You were, you were the healer. You know, there, there you came. The child, they, there, your parents lost all those, you know, their sons, their daughters. Then you, what a miracle you must have been, you know. Um, and so, but so by turning it that way, you, you know. And then I told him about Kuan Yin. You, you know, like I said, you're the Bodhisattva. You're already a Bodhisattva. You know, uh, and he didn't know what that was, a Bodhisattva. So I said, do you know about Kuan Yin? No, he didn't know about Kuan Yin. So Kuan Yin. 
uh, in, in Tibet, Kuan Yin changed uh, gender and became Avalokiteshvara with a uh, thousand arms. And the, each arm was meant to reach down and pluck a suffering being, you know, from the, uh, from samsara and pull them, you know. So I was like, you came down, you came to help your parents, you know. Uh, Kuan Yin, she who, hears your, she who hears our cries, you heard your parents' cries and you came. Um, so that was helpful to him, you know. And um, now he's told me he's, he, has, he has Kuan Yin statues in every, in every room of his house and office. Really? So, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Is there any paragraph or two that you would like to read um, from your book that you'd like to share with us tonight that pops up in this moment or that you have that you'd like to share? Curious. Um, well, the Zen thing in the book, you know, the, the Zen of therapy, uncovering a hidden kindness in life. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the book's title. So um, I was no scholar of Zen when I started the book, uh, but the, in that um, COVID uh, time when I was writing the reflections, I started reading a lot of Zen poetry uh, and books about Zen koans and so on. And um, I found one book, you might know that, do you know what uh, John Tarrant? Uh, he's, a, yes. he's a West Coast guy. So, um, uh, so I've read one of his books years ago. Yeah, yeah. he has a great book that, that um, I came upon called um, Bring Me the Rhinoceros and Other Koans. Mm -hmm. uh, and he like tries to take the mystery out of koans by, by talking about what they, what, what is their actual function? Um, and so I lifted uh, from his book, um, he, he goes through um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, attributes of koans, um, which I think would be nice to read. You know, the most famous koan is what is the sound of one hand clapping? But, um, but that wasn't really the original koan. The original koan was just what is the sound of one hand? And I, and I talk about that one in the book. It had nothing to do with clapping. It was just, what is the sound of one hand? And um, uh, it came from, from Hakuin, who was a great Zen master who uh, became enlightened in his 80s and then, then became a painter uh, and a calligrapher. And he did a drawing of this, of this koan, what is the sound of one hand? And the drawing was of a, a monkey with two hands over his ears you know, like hunched over over his ears, like his mind is going fat. He's, you know, an, an anxious monkey uh, with his hands over his ears. And then behind him is a, is a bird, a cuckoo flying in the air. And the, the, the cuckoo in Japanese uh, uh, iconography is like the symbol of springtime, like young couples go out in the springtime to uh, lie in the grass together to listen to the sound of the cuckoo. And the, the cuckoo flies with its beak open, making its sound, you know, but the monkey can't hear it. And then, and then under it, uh, a Hakuin writes, um, uh, uh, lift one hand, you, you know, um, lift one hand, even when not listening, you know. So the idea is, what is the sound of one hand? If you take this hand off your ear, you can hear the sound of the cuckoo. So that's the first explication of a koan. But so, so Tarrant in his book lists these seven attributes of koans. So I'll read that, okay? Great. Koans show you that you can depend on creative moves. Koans encourage doubt and curiosity. Koans rely on uncertainty as a path to happiness. Koans will undermine your reasons and your explanations. Koans lead you to see life as funny rather than tragic. Koans will change your idea of who you are and this will require courage. Koans reveal a hidden kindness to life. So that's where I got the subtitle from, you know, straight, straight from uh, John Tarrant. And then a little later in the book, I'll just read you. This is also from him, not from me. If you are used to living in a small room and suddenly discover a wide meadow, you might feel unsafe. Everyone thinks that they want happiness, but they might not. 
They might rather keep their stories about who they are and about what is impossible. Happiness is not an add-on to what you already are. It requires you to become a different person from the one who set off seeking it. So I like the, his um, uh, description of koans. I see that also as a description of therapy. So therapy and effective therapy is trying to do what he's saying koans do. You know, they show you that you can rely on creative moves. They encourage doubt and curiosity. Therapy relies on uncertainty as a path to happiness. You know, will mm -hmm. therapy will undermine your reasons and your explanations, help you to see life as funny rather than tragic, change your idea of who you are, and this will require courage. And therapy hopefully will reveal a hidden kindness in life. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Can you say more about how you bring in? koans and haiku and various psycho-spiritual teachings in your sessions with patients? How do you weave that in? Oh, oh I don't. I don't. Mm -hmm. I, only, I only wove that into the book. Um, so I, uh -huh. I, I wove all that into the book to try to describe the intangible, you know, thing about bringing spirituality together with therapy. Like, like what is it? I, I think it, it's, um, it's not so, it's not so concrete as uh, talking about koans or teaching meditation or uh, using haiku or any, that one session that I talked about with the uh, child of the Holocaust survivors, that, that, you know, there I was pulling Kuan Yin and the idea of a bodhisattva mm -hmm. in, but that was spontaneous. That was, I, that's the only time I've ever done that particular thing. Um, I tell another story in the book about another session where a, um, a, a woman was in my office and she had several years before lost her, uh, her soulmate and, uh, and she was in deep distress, you know, angry, but not, not really admitting the anger, but, but um, uh, uh, grieving, but, but I, was, uh, I wasn't sure she was grieving in as true a way as maybe she was capable of. And she was repeating something something on the order of, uh, I just need help. I just need something. I just need something, you know, to make me feel better. And um, uh, I keep in my office, uh, one, of, one of my patients came back from uh, an ashram, Neem Karoli Baba's ashram in India, came back and brought me a little bag of what, what they call prasad, which is like a food that's been blessed that you offer to the gods. And then they give back to you. And you, so you get some of that good energy. Uh, so I keep it hidden in a in a uh, ceramic jar on the on my bookshelf. So she's like, uh, you know, I just wish I, there was a pill or some magic. Some, you know, I said, oh, I, okay, you want some? I, I I have that for you. And I went and got some of the prasad out of opened the jar and took it out of the the um, cellophane, you know, and uh, and gave it to her. And she's like, you know, what is this? Is this like some psychedelic thing? Or no, it's like a sugar pill. Um, and she she took it. And it just and it paused the therapy, you know, like she her cries, her distress was interrupted because I had surprised her with this, you know, with with this thing that didn't make any sense, you know, like this, like she wasn't a spiritual person, she didn't know what prasad was, you know, um, but but she took it and she put it in her mouth and she she ate it and the whole complexion of the session, the whole texture of the session changed as a result. And then um, uh, she went home and that night she sent me an email saying, I don't know what that was, but that placebo medicine of yours, but it really, you should give that to all of your patients. It really changed something for me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, then when I wrote the session up and sent, we had a nice back and forth about that, where uh, that became like a motif or something for her. So you know various ways like that but but th that again that was um that's not something i thought about in advance it's like i'm i'm trying to pull on whatever i can to help the people who are under my care so so that means i'll pull the i, I tell a story in here of throwing the I Ching with a patient you know uh which is not something that i regularly do but i must have been stuck in, in some way with him. And I was looking like John Cage uses the I Ching and I, 
I was like, have you ever thrown the I Ching? We could ask the, the I Ching what to do here. And he was like, no, I don't, what's the I Ching, you know? So I, I took it off the shelf and we did it together. And, and the, the I Ching was like, he had described a dream that we were having trouble interpreting and the I Ching interpreted the dream perfectly, you know? Uh, so I tell that story in the book. So, uh, but mostly I'm just like, I'm not like crazy like that. Mostly I'm just like, uh, <laughs> you know, listening and trying to offer a helpful response. Yeah, well, you're obviously also following your intuition and some sort of synchronicity perhaps. And related to this, I noticed also that there were periods where there was a fair amount of personal disclosure. You're talking a little bit about your family, family vacation, your own process, and you're disclosing that also in the book. And you know, for therapists, that can be a delicate conversation. How much do I say? When do I say it? Is it in service of the patient? What will the impact be? You know, all those delicate moments. I'm curious if you want to share more about how that happens for you. Sure. Uh, well, I'm very aware of all that con the conversation about personal disclosure and so on, mm -hmm. and all the all the caveats are, are around that. But um, uh, I remember when I was younger and seeking therapy myself, uh, how much I, how much I did not like the therapists who I went to consult with who were hiding behind the uh, uh, the blank screen of therapeutic neutrality, you, you know, uh, in a sort of classic psychoanalytic mode. Um, I didn't want that. I, you know, I mean, it was the, it, it was the early seventies. I think culturally that was out of fashion already. I don't know how much I was just like a victim of the culture, but I think it was more than that. I, I think I was needing and seeking uh, a real person someone who could be real with me um, because I needed to figure out how to be real. Um, so yeah. um, so the, the fair, I've, I worked with two different therapists who were linked. One was the teacher and supervisor and therapist of the other. So, you know, um, so there's like a, a, a lineage thing in therapy like there is in uh, m many spiritual mm -hmm. uh, traditions. Uh, but both of those therapists were you, you know, yes, I'm your therapist, but if we meet outside of the office, I'm not going to be your therapist outside of the office. I'm just a person who you know. And mm -hmm. uh, there were no, each of them I saw in their own homes, you know, with their uh, newborn child or their, uh, in another case, their lover in the next room, you, you, you know, and my office uh, is in the building where, where a loft building in uh, lower Manhattan in the basement of the building where we also live. And my wife had a studio right next to the office. My children would, would be in and out of the building. Patients would run into them. I, I made no efforts to hide uh, um, aspects of my personal life. I was like, you know, um, and that was difficult for some patients. They didn't want that, but it was mostly just fine. And I think, um, and I think people really appreciated that I wasn't pretending to be anything other than what I was, you know, um, and that it didn't, wasn't threatening to know aspects of my personal life. Like, like what, what, uh, what's the problem with knowing that your therapist has children or has a wife or uh, has a life or, uh, you know, goes to, goes to the bathroom or uh, uh, needs to have dinner or was, is tired or, you know, but um, as you're saying, you, you know, uh, therapists err on the side also of too much disclosure and that's analogous to the intrusive or interfering parent, you know, who's uh, too busy making it be all about them instead of about the child. And that's certainly something that I've tried uh, not to be. So I've been very, very aware of, uh, uh, um, I, I don't think I'm doing any of this without thinking about it. Oh yeah, that was that was really evident to me in reading it. It was quite skillfully done, and uh, so I, I wanted to hear just more about your process around that. 
So we just have a few minutes left. Um, you end the book with your chapter called Kindness. Mm -hmm. And you take this trip to Hawaii mm -hmm. to spend some time with Ram Dass after not having seen him for, I think, a few years. Oh, yeah. Um, 20 years. At the yeah, 20 years. Yeah, at the mm -hmm. request of Jack Cornfield. Um, at, the suggestion, to him. at the suggestion of Jack Cornfield. Yeah. Uh huh. And so there's a phrase that you quote from Ram Dass We are all walking each other home. Mm -hmm. And I love that phrase. And um, as we move towards the end of our conversation before the Q&A, if you wanna share anything about what that means to you, what that means to you as a therapist, having this spiritual friendship that you call with patients, um, maybe we could take a couple of minutes and end with that before we move into the Q&A. Sure. Well, um, my, my uh, friendship with Ram Dass, uh, uh, he was both teacher, teacher and uh, inspiration and friend to me. Uh, uh, I wasn't, he had much better friends than, than me, but, but we, we did have a friendship that stretched over, um, over 40 years. Um, and I, I met him first when I was still an undergraduate in college and uh, he was just back from India. Uh, and uh, a, a professor of mine, professor of psychology of mine, was the person who had both hired and fired uh, Alpert, who became Ramdas, and Timothy Leary, uh, but he had stayed friends with him. So, uh, so Ramdas would stay in this professor's house, uh, and uh, and I spent a lot of time hanging out at that professor's house. So, um, uh, so, uh, uh, so I have Ramdas in the book, uh, both at the beginning and at the end, and a little bit in the middle, um, because. Um, uh, uh, I, he was really a, a, a big influence um, on my whole approach to uh, to being a therapist, and I, and I tell a story um, of going to visit him not this last time in Maui, uh, but twenty years before when he was living in Tiburon, uh, just after he had had a massive stroke that paralyzed him on one side and made it very difficult for him to. Uh, um, find the words for what he was thinking. He, he had an aphasia, which is very common when people have this kind of stroke. So um, his thinking wasn't impaired, but he couldn't put the words on what he wanted to say. And I went to visit him. Um, I was in my mid forties by then. So I'd been working as a therapist for more than a decade for sure. And uh, I hadn't seen him in, in 10 years, probably at that point. And he greeted me, and he uh, uh, he he always kind of teased me, and and I know for him I was always about twenty one years old, you know, because which is when he first met me. So he's like, "Oh, Mark, uh, are you a, a Buddhist therapist now?" You know, with a little bit of little little edge. And I was like, "Yeah, I, I guess I am," you know. Um, and then and then he said this thing that took him a long time to say, but he found the words, and he said. Do you see them, meaning my patients, do you see them as already free? But he, he spread it out over time. Do you see them you know, as already free? It took me a long time, meaning you know, a minute or so to understand what he was saying. And um, I couldn't have conceptualized it like that, but, but he could, but it struck me as absolutely true. And, uh, Th that vision, you know, of a kind of innate uh, Buddha nature or um, innocence, but also wholeness uh, that's already there behind the elaborated personality or the defensive structure that we all build up, you, you know, uh, that sense that the person who's coming in for therapy is um, it, you know embroiled in their problems, but that but that they're also already free, you know. So that there's another there's something else in them that I can reach for in my interactions. That that really uh, has guided me all the way through my uh, my years as a therapist, um, and uh, 
so then another 20 years went by, you know, before I, then I went to Maui, as you're saying, at, at Jack Hornfield's suggestion, because he said, you have to go see Ramdas. You know, he's, he's become the person that he always wanted to be. You, you know, all those uh, uh, 20 years or so of suffering under the stroke, he, was, he never complained about it. He was continuing to put out uh, a loving uh, energy to all the people who were, you know, helping him and, and around him. And, um, uh, and he had no need anymore to pretend to be uh, Ramdas, you, you know? Uh, so I, I tried to write about that at the end of the book as a, um, as a description maybe of uh, uh, what might be possible for, for all of us. But that thing of, uh, that thing of being already free, I, a friend of mine, I, let me see, I have it here. Um, a friend of mine who heard me talking about this on another podcast not, not that long ago, uh, just sent me this email. It's pretty short. But, um, let me read it to you, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we, maybe we'll take our questions. Yeah. So um, she's an old friend. And so she said, um, you know, I'm reading your book and I, you know, I like it, blah, blah. Uh, I've heard you tell the Ramda story in which he asked you if you see your therapy clients as already free a couple of times, she writes. I could never really understand what he meant and what you understood about that question. Somehow hearing it again and being out in California as an active grandparent, I have found my own understanding of that question. In a way that I was never able to see my children, I see my granddaughters as already complete with the capacities they will need, even though I do not have a clue about what the specifics of their childhood or lives as adults will be. I know they have an enormous amount to learn and experience and their own windy road to travel, but I see them as free or as complete souls. Somehow that understanding lets me be present with them in a deep way. Not sure if this at all overlaps your understanding, but I thought I would share it anyway. Love to you and your family. That really encapsulates it right there. Yeah, yeah. something. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you. Um, just very moved and filled uh, by this conversation. So we're going to transition. Uh, I'm sure there's some juicy questions. <laughs> so here we go. Okay, question from Sam. Can you speak about the Buddhist approach to addressing the feeling of emptiness? Yes, uh, the Buddhist approach to addressing the feeling of emptiness. So Sam, I, I assume you're talking about a kind of psychological emptiness, uh, not, not the Buddhist shunyata, uh, which is the, you know, the Sanskrit word for the Buddhist view of emptiness. Um, uh, but let me talk about that first, and then I'll come back to the psychological emptiness. So the, the, um, uh, that word shunyata um, connotes not, a, not an empty emptiness, but a, uh, 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 it, it, it actually um, uh, refers to a pregnant womb. So it's like a, 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 an emptiness that holds potential. Um, so the, the word is actually, actually, um, it's like a seed, uh, uh, a seed that, that's growing in a, in this void, you, you know? Um, so, so it's important not to, even from the Buddhist side to see emptiness as like, there's nothing there and the self doesn't exist, you, you know? Uh, but that the Buddhist view of emptiness is much more, much more nuanced than that, much, much more about the potential that we all have in that way that Ram Dass was talking about is already free. So the psychological emptiness that many of us, uh, not all of us uh, have suffered from, um, Winnicott talks about that as uh, uh, the, an absence where maybe there should have been more of a presence. So he talks about that psychological emptiness as um, uh, the result of a parenting style, perhaps where that was either too intrusive or too abandoning, you know, where the child has to create a, a kind of false front. He calls it a false self or a caretaker self to manage the, uh, 
um, the parental environment that's not good enough. And that, that leaves a feeling of emptiness, like, a, in, you know, because so much effort has gone into the, creating the, the false front. Um, I was puzzled when I was training as a psychiatrist. Uh, I worked for a number of years on a, um, uh, uh, inpatient unit in a psychiatric hospital where a lot of the patients were young, uh, some suffering from anorexia, some cutting themselves, some having made suicidal gestures, uh, a lot of them complaining of uh, this inner feeling of emptiness that I also knew from my own experience, you know, like uh, feeling like my, what, whatever myself was, it wasn't as, uh, uh, as together, as real, as enough, as the selves of the people around me, you know, so that thing of comparing uh, uh, self to other uh, often leads to a feeling of um, uh, uh, less than, uh, which can easily go to emptiness. Um, but I once had an encounter in those years with a, a well-known Tibetan Lama named uh, Gelek Rinpoche, who was uh, a professor at the University of Michigan, you know, educated first in Tibet and then at Cambridge in England and then taught in Michigan. So his English was good and, uh, and he understood both Eastern and Western concepts. And I said to him, is the psychological emptiness that my patients feel and that I felt and that maybe you know from talking to Westerners and so on, uh, is that emptiness the same or different from the Buddhist emptiness? Because I was confused about it uh, at the time. And he gave me a great answer that I always remember. He said that he started making this motion with his hand, like, what's that thing? What do you call it when a blacksmith hits, mm -hmm. it, you know? And somebody said, an anvil, an anvil, Rinpoche. Uh, he's like, yeah. He said, the, the psychological emptiness that you're saying, it's like untrained minds hitting against emptiness, you, you know? But they don't, they can't understand it well enough. So they, they take it, they, they make it too personal, you, you know, they make it about themselves, like, oh, my, I, my, I'm not enough, instead of that shunyata emptiness, you, you know, where you don't have to be enough, you know, if you relax into the self as you actually experience it, you, you know, then you can start to get a feel for, oh, there's no, there's actually no concrete, absolute entity that is me you know what is there instead there's a kind of there's something there's there's something but can you find it can you really put your finger on it you know where where is the real you you, you know and the, but there's something wait so but but what how do we know what that is so that that's kind of the beginning of uh transforming the personal destructive not good enough emptiness into this more nuanced and actually joyful feeling. So here's another question from the audience. <clears throat> do you ever do guided meditation or guided mindfulness exercises during therapy sessions? As a therapist, I've often thought that I should do this, but also have not wanted to impose it on clients. Um, no, I have never done that. Uh, I have been asked sometimes to do uh, uh, guided meditations or uh, visualizations or guided mindfulness ex exercises when I'm teaching, you know, at at Tibet House or in uh, yoga centers or in or at uh, Insight Meditation Society. So I've done it in those environments, um, but in uh, in the therapy office, I don't think I've ever done it. No, for the same reason, I think that, that, that you asking the question might be restraining yourself uh, from doing it. I've always felt there's so much going on just being a therapist, like just, just be the therapist, Mark, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh... <laughs> Great. Okay, there's another question from Larry. When you said you were looking for a therapist who could be real, how would you now understand what you meant by the word real in terms of how a person shows up in the world? Um, I think all I wanted, Larry, was uh, for the therapist to really be themselves, you know, with me, you, you know, um, and uh, that's what I loved 
about my um, the luck that I had in finding my meditation teachers, my spiritual teachers, when I was so young, uh, so that I could get to know them also as friends. You, you know, so um, I didn't have to idealize. Ramdas or Joseph Goldstein or Jack Hornfield or Sharon Salzberg, I could see that they were just people, you know, that they were struggling with their own issues. And yet they were incredibly loving, wise, helpful, generous uh, uh, teachers and friends to me. But they, but they weren't pretending to be, well, Ramdas pretended a little bit, but, but he was always like mocking himself for the pretending. So that, that, was, that was pretty good. Um, but that, I found that to be such a relief from on the spiritual side. And I was looking for something similar on the therapy side. Um, and so each person's different and each person's style is different. Each person's personality and character is different, but somehow you can tell when uh, when they're being real and when they're and when they're being superficial or pretending or hiding something, and uh, as a therapist with uh, with patients, that's very important also because that whatever that intuitive sense is of oh this person isn't there's more going on here than they're able to tell me, you know then I can lie in wait for a moment when I might be able to get them to be aware of themselves, you know, uh, in, in a way that they weren't before. So to become more real, that's what, that's what I'm looking for. So there's another question from Nat. What does an honored spiritual emotional existence look like for you? <laughs> and Nat, what are you asking? An honored, say it again, honored. What does an honored spiritual emotional existence look like for you? Um, I think a, an honored emotional spiritual existence is one that's constantly being uh, co-created. You know, I think it's a, I think that's why the Buddha taught the Eightfold Path you know, uh, because you can have great understanding, great realizations, uh, but if you don't put it into practice in a real life, you, you know, uh, with, with uh, um, the, the usual translation of the Eightfold Path is right this, right that, right livelihood, right speech, right motivation, mm -hmm. right effort. Uh, Professor Thurman, who I teach with a lot, he says a better translation is realistic. So, you know, how to be realistic, realistic speech, realistic effort, realistic meditation. Real, so, uh, so I think there's something creative, uh, something that we each have to keep, we have to keep creating a, a real or realistic and authentic expression of ourselves. That, that, that doesn't, um, uh, that responsibility uh, continues all through life. So I don't think it looks like any one thing. It just looks like a process. Thank you. So a question from the audience. What is the difference between the general category of spiritual bypass and your suggestion to the first client that he was the healer rather than a person who doubted whether they would ever be healed? Uh, the connection between that and spiritual bypass um, I think in his case, uh, he was actually bypassing his spiritual side. You, you know, he mm -hmm. he was he was he was mired in, in his um, uh, uh, sense of failure. You, you know that he he loved his parents so, so much, and he and they were dead already. You, you know, and he couldn't uh, uh, he he never healed them. You, you know. Um, and therefore he himself was never healed, but, uh, but he was missing, you, you know, he, he was too, uh, too focused on his own pain and, and not cognizant enough of what a gift he had already been to the world, you, you know? So I think that's a different kind of spiritual bypass, mm -hmm. um, but the same principle applies. 
Yeah. Question from Dan. I've always suspected <clears throat> that, uh, I've always suspected that the I think beneficial use of secular mindfulness would be inevitably invite curiosity and more openness to the deeper spiritual ideas of Buddhism. Do you think this might be a theme that the broader secular mindfulness community should or will have to reckon with? Uh, well, I'm a little worried uh, about the uh, secular mindfulness thing, um, uh, taking over the practice of psychotherapy too much. Uh, you know, I think, you know, when I, when I started out, mindful, no one knew what mindfulness was. It was, it was such a weird word anyway. Uh, um, and, but, but gradually over the years, through the work of John Kabat-Zinn and others, you know, mindfulness has really uh, become such an important tool of the therapeutic community. And uh, especially in its secular form, meaning that it's taken away from the rest of the Buddhist teachings. Um, and what, what I have seen is that a lot of young uh, uh, therapists, very well intentioned, uh, who are drawn to mindfulness want to become mindfulness based psychotherapists uh, with the hope and the expectation that mindfulness will is the treatment for everything you know, the way that people hope that Prozac was the treatment for everything, or the way that people hope that psychoanalysis was the treatment for everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think there's nothing is the treatment for everything. And if we try to make mindfulness be more than what it can be, it, the pendulum is going to swing away from mindfulness and, and that, that will get lost. So one of the things that I'm trying to do in, in this book, coming out of my own experience, is to show how, how rich the psychoanalytic, uh, uh, psychodynamic tradition is, how much there is for therapists to learn from that tradition, and how congruent it is with a Buddhist approach, how complementary it can be to a Buddhist approach, uh, uh, how helpful pulling on everything that, that could possibly help, including Prozac, including psychoanalysis, you know, including mindfulness, uh, um, including Jungian therapy and so on. Uh, uh, um, we, 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 I always think about the, um, those tankas of the medicine Buddha, who's, you know, big blue Buddha, uh, who's shown with big vats of medicinal herbs and pills sitting in front of him, you know, spilling out in front of him, like so many treatments. So I, I think they're, they're all aspects of the medicine Buddha, you know? So I, I worry that, uh, that the baby's getting thrown out with the bathwater in terms of uh, uh, people not paying attention to the psycho, psychoanalytic tradition, which has so much, still so much to offer, even if people expected too much from it and abused it and whatnot. Uh, but it's still there to help us as, as now is the Buddhist tradition. There's a question from the audience. What are your self-care practices? <laughs> My self-care practices? Um, uh, uh, I've been trying uh, every year uh, since my children were old enough uh, so to go on a silent uh, mindfulness-based meditation retreat, at least for a week every year at a, a place near the uh, Insight Meditation Society, which is in Massachusetts, sort of analogous to Spirit Rock that you have in California, a place called the Forest Refuge. Um, so I've tried to do that every year um, for the past uh, 20 years or so. Um, not, uh, not this past year during COVID. I was set to go during March of uh, 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 2020, but had to cancel at the last minute. Um, so I would say that's primary. I would, I would also say that, um, doing this work of being a therapist is a self-care practice, um, mm. that, uh, that's how it, it functions for me anyway, like a meditation, because for all the hours that I'm spending with other people, I'm not worrying about myself, you know, so the, 
the best self-care is when you're not worrying about yourself. Mm. Um, so uh, I try to take care of my body. I do, I do Iyengar yoga. I've, I've done uh, some Pilates for the past uh, 25 years or so. Um, I've liked to be outside. I, you know, I try to go for a walk uh, every day. Um, I watch a lot of television. Uh, um, I, I like sports. Uh, I read books. Uh, I read the New York Times in the morning and make my coffee. Um, I would say I see my family, see my children, and mm -hmm. and um, I go to look at a lot of uh, contemporary art with my wife. So I would say that's about everything. Quite a range, yeah. <laughs> well, in a way, L living your life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Another question from the uh, this one's from the audience. How can someone get started incorporating Buddhism into their practice? Into their psychotherapy practice? Is that the, that's the implication? I think so. Yeah. 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 I, I think that the whole thing is a, a personal integration. So, so I think the, the way to get started is to have a, a um, meditation practice, you know, cultivate a meditation practice for yourself. And if you have a psychotherapy practice, see your patients and then explore for yourself, are you bringing anything from one to the other, you, you know? Mm -hmm. And if so, what and how, you, you know? And that's, that's what I've been doing, you, you know? It's, a, um, it, it's something that I, I think it's way too soon. You know, Buddhism, every, every culture that Buddhism has moved to, it's transformed by integrating itself mm -hmm. into the culture that it has moved to. Um, so I think it's way too soon to say how it's going to integrate and what form it's going to take, even in with psychotherapy. So I think it's all up to us uh, individually to make our own integration, and then and then we can start to talk about it as you know as I'm trying to in this book. Yeah, I think that is the base is our own practice, um, which is part of what you were saying at the beginning. Our it's a we we bring ourselves into the relationship and patients feel that um and then there's also reading your books um for sure because <laughs> that'll help that'll help <laughs> that's what yeah. you've been doing <laughs> yeah, yeah. for many years and i noticed that'll myself help or it'll get in the way the danger the danger is that, <laughs> that no really is that then people try to emulate or or replicate something that was right for me but isn't right for them so i'm i think you know uh, I would want my books just to be inspiration for people to do it their own way. Mm. Nice. Well, um, so we're about the end of our time. Um, this has just been really rich and dynamic and it went to lots of amazing places. So I'm very grateful that you've come to CIS, that you've offered so much. Um, there's a lot to unpack here. The book is has about 50 or so, I think, chapters of different folks. Uh, short, some repeat, short little but, chapters, don't worry. Yes, two to four pages about, yeah. 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 Um, so they're pithy um, and, and loaded uh, with experience and uh, information. So. Uh, so I'm grateful to have met you and to have had a conversation with you and learned from you. Um, and so maybe you want to say some closing words before we uh, fully end. Mark. Well, I've just always wanted to come to CIS, so uh, so I'm almost there. And uh, thank thank you for having me, at least virtually. And um, you know. Uh, I really respect the work that's going on there. So glad to be part of it a little bit. Great. Well, hopefully you'll come back. And so we'll bring back Alex now. Thank you all so much for attending this evening. We hope you'll join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded. So if you'd like to watch it again or share it with your community, it will be available on our YouTube channel at this same link and later on our Facebook page. We also will feature this talk on our podcast, which you can find at www.ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. 
Thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful night.